Hello, Dr. Paul Reed Bowen. Hello, Sarah. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about um, who you are and what you do at the university? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in religions, philosophies, and ethics. I've been teaching here for quite a long time now. Got my 20 year award last year, so this is my 21st year. I started here as the youngest member of the department, and now I'm the oldest member of the department. <laughs> um, I teach a number of different subjects. I teach across six modules at the moment. So I teach at levels four, five, and six. And I teach an introduction to philosophical inquiry, sort of trying to inspire the students to reflect on what is knowledge and what is reality. And then I teach a range of second and third year modules on such things as philosophy of gender, applying philosophy, how to apply philosophy to a whole range of different cultural objects. So things like philosophy of film, philosophy of comedy, which uh, we have a lot of colleagues in other departments coming in and contributing to that module. But my main modules are, <clears throat> quite quickly, I teach a module on ecology and nature from a philosophical perspective. And I teach a third year module on life and meaning. So big questions about the meaning of life, mortality, absurdity, and I suppose basically what's it all about? Why are we here? Is it all meaningless? Um, but I also teach a, another third year module, which I haven't taught for a few years. I used to teach this a great deal many years ago, but it's called Spiritual Revolution. And it's concerned with the changing landscape of spirituality today. So I'm very interested in new religions and the kind of weird things that people believe. So I like new religious movements and things like Scientology and Wicca, witchcraft, paganism, modern Satanism, lots of different things like that. And I taught that a lot when I first started here, but I haven't taught it for about six or seven years. But still have interests in that area. Yes, very yeah. much so. And in terms of your the passion behind what you teach, what are your what are the areas of what you teach that you feel most close to in terms of your own personal interests? I mean, we teach things that we enjoy to teach, even if they're not our specialist subject we areas. Do. But but in your case, where is where does that lie? I think the question of what do I feel most strongly about in terms of my teaching, that's a difficult question um, because I get different emotional content from different modules. My Ecology and Nature module always feels the most important. It's emotionally quite difficult to teach because we're dealing with a period of ecological crisis and it's difficult material for the students, it's difficult yeah. material for me. It often reminds me of the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. You know, we have to grapple with issues of being very angry and very upset and sometimes feeling rather depressed about the material. But we're trying to bring ethical perspectives and also philosophical perspectives to try and think about this better. Mm. And that's crucial for the time we're living in going forwards. So I really try and inspire students to think differently about the natural world, the more than human world, and mm. it's difficult material, Yeah, but it's probably the most important work I do, I think. But presumably a lot of those students come already with anxieties about the issues of, around climate. They must come to the class already worried in some senses. It's not that they arrive to a, a Paul Reed Bowen class and become worried about the environment, maybe perhaps a little bit more worried than they were before, but it feels like students that we teach often, they have that, that ecological anxiety is quite deep for, for many of our students. It is. I think the students we have are preloaded mm -hmm. with climate anxiety yeah. and other anxieties coming, of out, course, of, coming yeah, out of the period of COVID. And yeah, they have a lot of baggage already, but it's surprising that they're not as yet what I would call big system thinkers. Mm. They, they haven't always joined the dots. Yeah. So climate is one part of a bigger problem, well, a whole yes. set of problems. And often they're unaware of sort of the dimensions of the sustainability crisis, mm -hmm. resources, how much stuff there is, how climate links with food production, um, 
how fossil fuels figure into this. There's some awareness, but I think what I try and kind of encourage them to do is make connections with the larger systems that we inhabit. And that contribute each in, in turn to that bigger crisis picture. Yeah. yeah. It's very much a polycrisis. Yes, it's the kind yes, of a new sure. term that's sort of appeared about a year ago. This is the polycrisis. Yeah. I think people have very quickly realised that the situation we're in is multifaceted and you can't be a reductionist. No. I'm not anti-reductionistic because I think actually reductionism is a powerful methodology in the sciences, but there's a need for philosophy and mm. there's a need for kind of what I call big thing, you know, big picture thinking. Yeah at political and, and philosophical levels. And would you see those two as connected as well, actually, I, w I wonder? Like, is it a political question as well as a philosophical it, one? It is. It's all, everything is kind of imbricated in everything else, yeah. I would say. Um, one of my early interests, which is probably rather strange as a man, I was kind of motivated by a lot of early feminist work and radical feminism. Um, Nothing strange about that. Well, uh, but so, so one of the primary slogans of early feminism was the personal is political. Yeah. And you can extend that phrase quite readily. You know, you can say, well, the personal is political is environmental, is climatological, yeah. Yeah. is spiritual. All of these things are interconnected. Yeah, indeed, which is really interesting, um, really interesting. Especially because I'm aware of the fact that you also have influences coming in from non-Western traditions of philosophy that you've come to through study of Indian religions and so on and, uh, and so forth but like longer term thinking about that interconnectedness issue which may be informed to some extent would you say the way that you think about this picture or it has a, had a background influence on your thinking do you think? Yeah the global perspectives mm. they're trying to see different ways of making sense of the world around us, mm. um, I think inevitably requires us to engage with Asian, mm -hmm. South American, Oceania, and mm. I suppose my own perspective is I'm always looking for different tools, different yeah. um, lenses to try and make sense of the world. And that was yeah. really my, I suppose that was my gateway into the subject. I was very interested in the kind of weird, strange beliefs that people have and the different ways that very different often very different ways people have of um, making sense of the world yeah and on that question I'm going to ask you a slightly more nihilistic question mm -hmm. when you say making sense of the world do you think we can do more than make sense of it are there ways that, that these kinds of practices can help us resolve problems in the world whether they be on an individual personal like we can resolve or we can come to for example even if the world itself can't be fixed we can perhaps come to personal point of acceptance about the impending crisis that may not be avoidable mm. or depending on how we see that crisis and what our views are on the science and this sort of thing do you feel like philosophy can actually have a role in 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 even small or, or big in, in solving problems not just outlining them and not just laying them out there for all to see and is there is there an optimism there at some level there is a certain optimism mm -hmm. um i think if you know me i tend towards a pessimism but it's kind of more of a gallows humor pessimism yeah, yeah, i'm yeah. students often wonder why i can raise a smile when i'm talking about rather bleak subjects a bit of dark humor never, a bit of dark humor anyone, yes did they yeah. um did it even <laughs> yeah. i think philosophy is a <clears throat> necessary element of trying yeah. to deal with this but i think the way i think the way you've put it can it lead to action that's very very difficult because Humble. i think we're very aware that you can know certain facts you know you can know the facts of the matter but that doesn't necessarily motivate yeah appropriate action so again it's reductive to think that one thing can be one piece of the puzzle you need a bigger picture yeah. that philosophy can be involved in it's, it, it's part of a whole it really. is and you'll find Philosophy tries to make sense of this. You, yeah. you get the what's called the is ought gap in ethics. Yeah. You know, you may something may be the case, but then what you ought to do is a rather different matter. Yeah, and we can all wake up in the morning knowing what we ought to do. It doesn't yeah. mean we do it, as we know, and as most people who've encountered issues with the climate crisis know that we all could do better, couldn't we, in terms of the things that we buy. And mm -hmm. to be fair, I'm not that convinced by individual consumerism being the main problem. I think it's larger yeah. scale issues and political level issues. But 
that's not really relevant here, but you know, we can all, we all, we all, none of us lives a a life of. Yes, and it's it's also kind of a point that Nietzsche makes. You know, yeah. it's it's not simply a matter of what you know. It's not a matter of knowing. It's how you know. It's yeah. kind of it's not simply believing. It's how you believe. Yeah, and for that reason, I'd actually turn <coughs> back again to the, the to the Asian traditions because I think, in some senses, at least my knowledge of classical Asian traditions, is that they were more. What's more distinctive about them, or what I'd like to say is more distinctive about them, is that they. They're action-oriented from the beginning. Hmm. They're, they're problem-solving. Uh, uh, um, a supervisor of mine who's like very huge in the area of, of, of study of both Japanese and Chinese culture would always make a, make a sort of blunt comparison between ancient Greek philosophy and he would say, if, if an ancient Greek philosopher came across um, an item and it was unknown to them, they would say, what is it? Uh, and if an ancient Chinese philosopher came across an item, they'd say, how do we eat it? Yes. Right, that there would be this kind of automatic pragmatism to, to the philosophy itself. So do you feel <clears> like <throat> the way that we set up philosophy potentially leads to that gap between philosophy and action? Or is, that, is there something going on there with the way that we do philosophy? It, it's certainly something about the way Western philosophy has been defined. Or um, traditionally, at least, <clears> yeah. And I think that's part of its relationship with also with Western religion. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something we often use... We, you know, in the past, we used to teach this to religious studies students... There's a very much a difference in the West. There's a focus in the West on orthodoxy, mm. having the right belief, whereas yeah. going East, you find praxis and praxis what you do and is much more important. And actually, the doing, yeah. whatever the doing may be, and the doing can be a thinking as well. So absolutely, think, and that yeah. carries over into philosophy yeah. as well. Really There's a very different yeah. emphasis really on philosophy as a lived activity, yes. a way of life, yes. whereas. Western philosophy, Western analytic philosophy, philosophy becomes something you can just pick up. And it's, you know, it's a convenient little tool for illuminating the world and doing things. But then you can put... It doesn't have the same degree of, like, <coughs> we don't get home with us, necessarily. And that, that it, which comes on to my next point, which philosophy is a way of life, the Hado picture of philosophy yeah. as, a, as a way of life. Well, it can be put in different ways, I think. Philosophy as... I mean, when we talk about philosophy as in its ancient Greek form as love of wisdom, wisdom implies pra- 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 practical wisdom. Like wise people aren't the sort of people we think of as knowing lots of things but bumping into doors all the time, are yes. they? They're the sorts of people who manage to get around the world in a way that is wise. Mm. It's something, something more pragmatic to that view even in ancient Greece. And So connecting that to your own biography and where, where you how you developed as a philosopher, as a thinker, as a teacher. Let's like, go back a bit, maybe, and talk first. How did you come to studying philosophy or studying in the first place in higher education? Let's, let's ask that question first, especially for students or potential students that <coughs> might be watching or listening. How did you, wh- where do you come from? And if you don't mind mm-hmm. ans- answering that question, and how did you get to the point where you decided you wanted to study and then, then study philosophy? Okay. Where do I come from and how did I get into philosophy or higher education? Good question. Yeah. Um, I don't tend to talk about that too much, but I'm quite happy to. If you're happy to. I am, yes. I, my route into academia was non-typical. Yeah. I'm a first generation of my family to go into the university. Yeah. I was quite lazy at school. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I got through on natural ability until A-levels. I relate to that story. And then it caught up with me, and I didn't do very well at Mm A-levels. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. All Mm -hmm. I knew was I didn't want to go to university. Mm -hmm. So I left university with a couple of poor low-level A-levels. Or like high... Sorry, I say high school, but that's the sort of US English. But you left left secondary school. I did, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I effectively drifted for... About eight or nine years. When you say drifted? I did different things. Interesting drifting, I, I took an easy option. I worked with my father for yeah. seven or eight years yeah. in the building trade. Interesting. So I was a plasterer and a oh, labourer. But also I did some clerical work, some office work as well. So I did different things. But at the same time, I was reading lots of strange things in my spare time. Ah, so you, you, were always a, you were a reader? I was a reader. Yeah. I read French philosophy. I read Simone de Beauvoir, which was very interesting, reading de Beauvoir in the evening and then working on a building site very during the day. You get this strange split consciousness. So 
and also, <clears throat> you know, yeah, uh, an interesting story. Yeah, but I was also reading Gnosticism, yeah. occultism, Hinduism, mm -hmm. Buddhism, Taoism. So I was very interested in, I think, as I said already, the very strange things people believe, the different yeah. ways people think. And Did around you... about the age of 26, I thought, oh, maybe I could do something with this. Mm. So I did a couple of A-levels in my spare time. Something did really well. I thought, oh, this is, I'm doing really well now. Maybe I could go to university. And I did so. I went to Mid Wales. I went to Lampeter University of Wales. And Great did, university. I visited it. Yeah, I did religious studies and philosophy. Okay. Loved it. Felt inspired, passionate for what I was doing. Uh, went on to do a, a master's degree at the same university in feminist theology. Very Because I was really interested in gender and goddesses. And that seemed a, the right thing to do at the time. Yeah. And yeah, I did really well. I got offered an opportunity to edit a, a volume while I was doing my master's degree, which is Oops, this themes and issues in Hinduism. Mm -hmm. That was really scary because I was a poor master's student editing a book. Editing a volume, that's quite a big deal, yeah. isn't it? Telling professors what to do, yeah. which I didn't feel I really prepared to do. And professors don't like to be told often. Sometimes. No. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Did, yeah. Did a conference paper while I was doing my Wonderful. master's yeah, at the first goddess conference in the UK, and that was really, that was a doorstep to a PhD. And is that what we see here, the goddess as nature? You do, that is my PhD. That's your PhD yeah. in publication form? Yeah. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? I will, yes. I yeah. got a chance to do, well, I applied for a bursary. Yeah and won it. So I got, I got three years funding to do my PhD at the University of Gloucestershire with uh, Melissa Raphael, who's kind of leading goddess expert in the UK. So that was a wonderful opportunity. But I'd met her at the conference where I gave the paper. That's so to these happenstance accidents, how you it get happens to know... often like that. That's how I met my, my supervisor also. Yeah. Yeah. And the book itself was bringing together lots of my interests that have been percolating for probably about a decade. So it brought together an interest in feminism, an interest in goddesses, but also an interest in gender, the kind of gender of the divine. And it was a nice opportunity really to kind of try and unify a whole set of interests I had. Mm. And it was centred around what we might call feminist paganism and what's called theology. So not theology, but theology, which is discourse about the goddess rather ah. than discourse about God. Right, yeah. And it like was... in the same Andrew category of the language connection. Yeah, you can also have theology, which is the theology. many gods. Ah, so yeah. the theoi is, yeah, theoi. polytheism. But mm. yeah, theology was this thing I was working on and it was an attempt really to try and unify the beliefs of the goddess movement, which was always very suspicious of philosophy. It saw philosophy as something rather patriarchal, masculinist, and, you know, kind of doing violence to the world. So I, I was very worried about what I was doing. I had this ethical dilemma throughout my PhD about whether a man should be doing this, should I be writing theology, and also should I be doing something very patriarchal, uh, trying to impose categories on it. If we can't have male feminists, then feminism might not go very far. No. That's what I would always say. So I, I worried about that for a long time, and I think I wrote some articles about it, this yeah. kind of methodological Concern or reflexivity. Yeah. And I suppose I eventually came to the conclusion that I was both... A, my gender was really a problem, but also a resource for my mm -hmm. feminism. So it's that notion of the pharmacon. You know, it's both cure and poison you know I was, yeah. I was a pro my gender was a problem but it was also a resource and i think that's the same when we think about for example in contemporary context thinking about race right yeah um if, if only people who aren't white spend any of their time thinking and talking about and mm. discussing issues surrounding race and racism there's a problem there there's a there big is. problem yeah there and is. it does it's not helpful to those communities or, or supporting of them at mm. all so so the work Goddesses Nature is the thing I'm probably most well known for. Yeah. It's the thing I get emails about occasionally yeah. and uh, yeah, get invited to things. And you say it was percolating for a long time, which seems to be good always in my experience of books. Mm. The longer they percolate, the more they turn into things that we feel like we really must write. There's a tendency yeah. in academia to feel like you, you must write a book, publish a book, but the longer we have to kind of 
figure out what that book should be. It's a very specific decision to make. Different from an article. You can write an article on a relatively small... Absolutely. I, I think there's a very strong argument for slow scholarship. Slow scholarship, yeah. And, of, and, and quality versus quantity, right? Yes. It's that, kind about, of, that, ex, that kind of excuses my low output of publications, <laughs> not at all, probably. Though, really. But I think it's <clears> about... It, it, it's, it's a quality issue, right? And it's also about... Yeah. If, if the academic world pushes us to publish things for the sake of publishing them, then what we get is a lot of naff stuff where people are saying things that they don't really need to say. Whereas, like, I mean, I, this was give, advice given to me by, to by by my supervisor when I thought about turning my PhD into a, a book, and I could have, I think I probably could have got a, a contract, and, and I just sort of, I, I was uncomfortable about it because I wasn't that happy with the PhD work, and I was keen to move on to something else. But also they said to me, look, don't write a book until you must and I felt that was really good advice. Like, until you feel like you've got something to say. Yes. That, that's worthy of a, a book-length study. And for that reason, I've generally... And also philosophy has moved in the direction of more discursive article-type writing and so on and so forth. I think it's good for students to realise that. I think mm. students have a certain pressure that comes with assessments, mm. but they also have to learn they can explore ideas. Yeah. You know, while at university, that's their free space to pursue ideas that interest them. I think a lot of the reading I did at university was things that weren't prescribed. No. You know, I just explored the library. I was reading things that weren't on any of my modules. Mm. You know, I was reading Baudrillard and I was reading you know, strange ideas about cultural studies and yeah. media studies. So I think... And learning to learn is partly about that, isn't it? And also you curate your own degree in some senses, don't yes. you? Because I was very interested. I did have a strong interest in content of philosophy. I went to a wonderful uni and I had a great experience there, but there was nobody teaching anything that was non... When we, again, I'm going to do it in scare quotes because it's a slightly problematic terminology, but it wasn't Western. And I was fascinated by Western, non by Chinese and Japanese thinking, and, and that meant going to the library and reading yeah. those things. And, and I, I felt like, you know, those, those skills translated. I'd learned, obviously, I didn't know enough about the background and the context and the culture, and those are all things that came later, but just those skills of learning that I'd learned in those other mm -hmm. courses were giving me an opportunity to understand and think about these new resources and going, be, going outside the box, I suppose. Absolutely. I mean, I always tell students that... They should seize this window of time, this period of time, this three years, just to explore and, you know, try on different ways of looking at the world, new values, and, you know, just explore ideas. That's, yeah. that's where my... I mean, that's what I think philosophy is about, really. It's about exploring concepts and trying to feel your way. I mean, it's very effective as well. Feel your way through different ways of thinking. Yeah, for sure. And in terms of your current projects, what are your mm. most recent or perhaps percolating or in, in, in progress projects? My current project is another example of slow scholarship mm -hmm. because it's something that I've been working on now for rather horrifyingly 12, 13 years. And it's a work on the ecological future. It is a book manuscript. It's one mm. I've been sitting with for a long time. Sometimes I think, who am I, who am I writing this for? Uh, one of those academic worries, but it's and, a project and will there about. Will be enough left by the time? Precisely. <laughs> by the time we get to publish it. Yes. Yeah. Let's hope. hope That's hopefully, there will be. I'm sure yes. there will be. Not because I'm expecting you to take too long, but there's problems with the earth. We mm. know that. <laughs> but it's a mixture of philosophy, uh, narrative, but also science. So it's what we might we sometimes call this transdisciplinary. It's yeah. bringing different disciplines together uh, and trying to do something creative with them. Partly, it's a bit of futurism. I'm speculating inevitably about the future and not, not able to say anything with certainty. But I am talking, I'm talking and trying to theorise the trajectory we're on yeah. and the long-term future and a lot of the material, political, religious trends that are unfolding. So yeah. it's really kind of a work of ecological philosophy. Um, Which is interesting because new information is coming in all the time. There is. That's one thing that mm. has delayed it. Every, mm, yeah. You know, every year you there's get... There's new things to think about. There's new data. Yeah. And yeah. you think, oh, no, I've got to kind of reformulate yeah. what I'm doing. Mm. Understandably, yeah. And I think where some of my thinking is now, though, it's very much about <clears throat> what we sometimes in philosophy call ontology. I'm interested in different ways of understanding the forces at, at work in the world. So mm. I'm very interested in kind of different notions of agency. And this links in with different ideas about animism, ancient animism, you know, who do we co-inhabit the world with? 
Many indigenous peoples think this is just, well, tree people, river people, fox people, hedgehog people, as one of my lecturers used to talk about. Um, but also today, we, we live in a world where there are kind of monstrous agencies. And that's something I wrote a few papers out quite recently. I'm very interested in the notion that corporations, cities, nations, also media networks, um, energy assemblages, you know, we, we live in a world where there are forces at work that have their own um, capacity to change the world and we, we, we just co-inhabit with them. We're not in control. So, and they are systems in the sense of having almost organisms. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, ending on a slightly less worrying note. Okay. Um, if you're talking to students maybe thinking about studying at university or studying with us already... Or not, actually, maybe let, let's talk to students who are thinking about studying at university and thinking about studying philosophy. What, what, what would your advice be in terms of like choosing where they go or how to think about what they might want to do? Or, you know, is there something about Bath Spa that you would want to tell them? Or do you have any sort of comments about, about the kinds of choices they might be wanting to make and the kinds of priorities they might want to have in this current in, 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 period in time? Because I think it's important mm. for us to be very aware of the fact that all the students that are thinking about going to university are worried about the same kinds of problems that you're talking about today, about the ecological crisis and about the poly crisis, about issues about jobs, about issues about the, you know, the crisis of the cost of living and all those things <coughs> com com combined together that are very overwhelming, especially for young people. Um, do, you have any, what we, do you have any advice on that? Or would you not want to give advice? Or what would you... I always hesitate. Yeah. It's difficult. I, I mean, I, I, I don't like giving ad that kind of advice to young people because I don't know what we should be doing. No, of course. And I, yeah, rather, I understand that, yeah. I rather wrestle with those questions with students when they're here. So mm. it's much more, I think it's more important to try and think through these things with students. Yes. Students who are looking for what to do next from A-levels, mm -hmm. um, you've got to try and find a university that's going to allow you to pursue your passions. You've yeah. got to think, you know, you've got to ask yourself, am I passionate about this subject? And is this university going to allow me to kind of go at this in the kind of way I want to? And that yeah. requires open days. It requires a bit of research. Yeah. I think looking ahead towards the kind of world we may be moving into, I think you've got to look for universities that are thinking a bit ahead of the curve, that are looking towards sort of applications of philosophy, that are worrying about a future that might be very different. And there are universities doing that. Yeah. I think we're doing that. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. But there are some universities which are quite just fixed in their traditional way of doing things and just carry, you know, business as usual. Yeah. And for some students, that might be what they're exactly It might what be what they're looking for, for yes. Yeah. You know, that might be what they're looking for. Yeah. But with an eye on the big picture, I think you've got to be thinking about, is this university going to give me certain skills, certain ideas, and allow me to work with other people that are worrying about this? And, you know... Well, share concerns, I suppose. Yes, a, how, a yeah. shared worry. Whether that's staff or students or the, the general picture of the programme, yeah. Absolutely. Because I feel like I chose my, in some senses, I feel like I chose my program at random and my mm. undergraduate program at least, and and I lucked out because it, I end lucked out and ended up in a university where I loved the program most mm. parts of it, but yeah, it does seem very valuable to actually look at what the program is and who the people are that will be teaching potentially teaching me, and think about how much I'm going to enjoy that and what I'm going to get out of that, and that seems like that, maybe that's a, it's, it's not advice, it's just sort of a suggestion. No, I'm probably not. I'm probably not best placed to do this because I was, again, I was 27 when I went to university mm. and I did quite a lot of research and I thought, what, what's going to be the right university for me? And did lots of open days. And I was quite happy with where I ended up. It, you know, it was quite a little isolated university in mid Wales and that suited me. And it had a strong department mm -hmm. with courses that I knew I was looking for. So, so I, you were better prepared in that sense? I was better prepared. I was more of a point somewhere on the map and yeah. hope that it goes well. And it did. So I was happy with that undergraduate choice, but Good. almost by accident, I think. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll pretend I was really well researched and I looked into it in lots of detail. Not, not, the, um, not the most concentrated student, wasn't sure about university at the same time. Ah. 
Anyway, it's been really lovely talking to you. I'm sure we'll talk again. And thank you for telling us about the work that you're doing and have been doing and the teaching that you do here. And again, congratulations on your 20 years at Bar Spa. Thank you, Sarah. Probably as I'm happy to say, my often thought of, as, I think of you as my kind of like sage of knowledge about what goes on at the university whenever I want to try and find. I'm probably annoying that I ask you so No, that's very kind. Happens, uh, I don't think I'm the best person, but uh, at least there's maybe well, something that comes with experience. Well, that's part of your, you know humble nature isn't it so but yeah, you do seem to yeah have 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 good advice for more junior scholars i'm not can't, i can't call myself a junior scholar anymore but no you know well, I'm slightly more junior scholars and it's really helpful to have that so, thank you very much and nice thanks for everything that you do at the university to uh, mm. make the program so wonderful well i think i'm primarily an educator that's how i see myself i yeah. just enjoy teaching more than anything so. i think the students feel that too mm. thank yeah. you brilliant